Uh, I'm going to today, like Ken said, I oversee the Lake Erie Fisheries Program. Um, based out, I'm based out of Sandusky, Ohio, uh, and uh, essentially cover all of Ohio waters of, of Lake Erie. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about managing the Lake Erie walleye and yellow perch populations, um, kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of how we <clears throat> essentially move uh, assessment and uh, research uh, and, uh, into uh, managing those populations through implementation of either bag limits or uh, individual transferable quotas for our commercial fisheries. So I'll start out with a little background on the Lake Erie fisheries and then uh, talk about the uh, interagency role that we play in walleye and yellow perch management on Lake Erie. Uh, cover off some of the, the guiding principles that we use for managing uh, particularly walleye and yellow perch and then kind of get into the weeds a little bit on, on how we implement uh, the interagency recommendations from the Lake Erie Committee for both walleye and yellow perch. So I'll kind of jump right in. Lake Erie is a big, uh, big, big lake uh, by most standards. It's a relatively small great lake, but uh, Ohio has uh, over 2 million acres of jurisdictional waters in Lake Erie, and, and Lake Erie truly is the, the fish factory of the Great Lakes. It's the most productive um, uh, Great Lakes from a fishery standpoint. Uh, they're over Lake Erie, the, the number of fish harvested from Lake Erie uh, equals the number of fish harvested from all the other four Great Lakes. So that, that should give you a kind of a sense of how productive Lake Erie is is from a fishery standpoint. It's also really complex though. Um, not only is, is, is it complex uh, ecologically, we've got uh, the West Basin that's relatively shallow and warm moving eastward uh, towards the uh, Eastern Basin which is relatively deep and cool. Uh, diverse fish communities, we also have a complexity associated with the uh, uh, management structures associated with Lake Erie. There's five jurisdictions that, that actually have have waters on Lake Erie, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario, and we all have to work together to ensure that we manage the resources sustainably. Uh, fish don't respect those jurisdictional boundaries, so what happens in one jurisdiction could negatively impact other jurisdictions. That's why we work together. Uh, as complex and diverse as the fish communities are in Lake Erie, we have a very diverse stakeholder group as well, uh, not only in Ohio but across the lake. Uh, primarily in Ontario, the fisheries are driven, or uh, primarily commercial fisheries, whereas in Ohio we've got a very significant recreational fishery as well as a commercial fishery, and, and, and other states as well have, have fairly significant recreational and, and smaller commercial fisheries. Uh, so it creates a lot of complexity. That's why we use uh, a lot of process rules to kind of drive how we manage the lake. That incorporates the science that uh, we're uh, annually collecting out on the lake into a decision-making process for us. And we have to because it's big business. And here are some kind of facts on Lake Erie, and I talked about the diversity of the fish and the fish fisheries and the fish communities on Lake Erie, but really walleye and yellow perch are king. Um, and here's some facts on the recreational commercial fisheries, and this is Lake Erie wide. Uh, more than 7 million angler hours uh, are expended on Lake Erie by recreational anglers. About 94% of those are targeted at walleye and yellow perch, so the vast majority of folks out on the water are pursuing walleye and perch. About 13 million pounds harvested, uh, and that's, again, the vast majority uh, of our recreational fishery is, uh, harvest is walleye and yellow perch. And they, they generate over a billion annually across the lake. So that's a chunk of change, and that includes, you know, direct expenditures associated with, with uh, bait and tackle, as well as uh, other indirect expenditures, including motorboat fuel, um, hotel, lodging, restaurants, those kinds of things. Commercial fishery is also fairly significant out on Lake Erie. Uh, Lake Erie provides probably the most walleye and, uh, uh, and yellow perch to the commercial markets across North America as well as internationally. 
about 22 million pounds of, of fish are harvested annually from Lake Erie, and, and perkets comprise about 35 percent of that harvest. And that would be walleye and yellow perch. Uh, the uh, landed value of the commercial fisheries across the lake are around $350 million annually. And, and about 75% of that value is associated with the Perkins. So even though it's only 35% of the commercial harvest, the value lies in, in walleye and yellow perch. And one thing that I'd like folks to note is that uh, both walleye and yellow perch populations are all sustained by natural reproduction. None of the jurisdictions around Lake Erie stock. Um, uh, <clears throat> they're all, all, both or all of these populations are sustained by naturally reproducing individuals. So that's, that's a key to kind of um, why we manage Lake Erie so intensively. Um, we don't have the control to be able to, to dump fish out there and, and see a measurable response in two and a quarter million acres. A little more background um, on Lake Erie walleye and yellow perch. Uh, in Lake Erie, the walleye fishery itself generates uh, right around a billion dollars, and that's in, in all jurisdictions. Um, in the U.S., uh, walleye uh, are harvested strictly by recreational stakeholders. There is no targeted commercial fishery for, for, for walleye in, US, in any of the U.S. waters. In Ontario, there is both a recreational and a commercial uh, fishery uh, operating in those jurisdictional waters. The vast majority of the harvest is associated with the commercial uh, uh, industry up there. And uh, for walleye, there generally is one uh, population. So we, we consider it a west central population. It's a population that reproduces in the west basin generally and then utilizes the western, central, and even the eastern basin during the summer months. They're highly migratory. Uh, we have fish that spawn down in the Maumee River, which is off Toledo, swim all the way down to Buffalo, New York uh, for the summer, and then turn around and come back and reproduce uh, in the Maumee River again the next year. We also have fish that exit the system, uh, the Lake Erie system proper, head north up into Lake Huron. And we've had uh, tag returns come back from as far north as, as Georgian Bay up in Lake Huron. So these fish move around a lot. They don't respect those jurisdictional boundaries. The Lake Erie yellow perch fishery is uh, uh, a little different in that it as well generates right around a billion dollars annually lakewide. <clears throat> Most jurisdictions uh, in Lake Erie have both uh, commercial and recreational uh, industries that are operating on, on these populations and a little more complexity as well. Uh, we have four separate populations that we manage in, in Lake Erie. We've got a population that we manage in the western basin. Then we've got a, another population that we manage in the west central basin, which is pretty much from Huron, Ohio, to Fairport Harbor. And then we've got a population in the east central basin, which is from Fairport, Ohio, east to, to uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. And then we've got a, an east basin population, which is Erie, Pennsylvania, to Niagara Falls. So a lot more complexity with the yellow perch, but really the same principles apply, and, and the same process applies. So kind of just a, a real brief uh, recap on, on the, the background material. These truly are interjurisdictional fisheries. Uh, we're managing stocks that, that move around a lot. <clears throat> And we have to work together. We've got a process in place to work together with our other jurisdictional partners to make sure that uh, we're uh, managing the fishery sustainably and, and meeting stakeholder needs. For walleye, we've got one population. It makes it pretty easy. Uh, for yellow perch, we've got multiple populations. And the, the graphic up in the upper right here shows those management units or the populations that I was talking about. Um, multiple jurisdictions and stakeholder groups associated with the fisheries, uh, recreational fisheries. We've got a very large user base. In Ohio, we estimate right around 300,000 anglers uh, utilize the, the fishery resource on an annual basis. And then we've also got a commercial fishery. Um, in Ontario, the commercial fishery is relatively large, about 200 licensed captains a year. Um, operating up there. In Ohio, we've got about 18 commercial trap nets that, that operate out on Lake Erie. They're both very important, and both of those fisheries, uh, as the Division of Wildlife, were mandated to uh, regulate and manage. So overall, the, the, these fisheries generate right around one and a half to two billion dollars of, of revenue a year. So very significant economically. 
Next thing I wanted to do was kind of step into the, the management structure, particularly at the interagency uh, level. And as I talked about before, there's multiple jurisdictions that share these fisheries resources. Uh, four states, including Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and one province, Ontario. Again, shared resources, highly migratory or broadly distributed. So we've got a uh, joint management structure that, that we have in place, and that is actually um, the uh, under the auspices of the Joint Strategic Plan for the Management of Great Lakes Fisheries. Each of the uh, Great Lakes jurisdictions uh, have essentially signed on to the Joint Strategic Plan for Management of Great Lakes Fisheries, which commits uh, each of those jurisdictions to managing these, these shared stocks in a shared way so that one jurisdiction doesn't negatively impact the fisheries in other jurisdictions. Uh, the, man, the plan itself is administered by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which is a, a line item federal agency that just kind of oversees the plan and facilitates uh, fisheries management. Uh, they don't have any management authority. It's all in the state and provincial hands. We're the ones who, who have the authority to manage those resources, but they help us do it. And they help facilitate the, the lake committees. Uh, Lake Erie has a lake committee called the Lake Erie Committee that's comprised of senior fisheries managers from each of the jurisdictions, and those senior fisheries managers are supported by technical staff who on an annual basis put information together to help um, the uh, lake committee members um, make decisions on uh, harvest and stocking um, and those kinds of things. Additionally, the Lake Erie Committee solicits input from those various stakeholders that I talked about earlier, the commercial and, and uh, recreational uh, fishing interests out on the lake. A couple of key components to um, the uh, Lake Committee structure and the Joint Strategic Plan is that um, the Lake Committee members have committed to con uh, consensus decision making on things like harvest and stocking. So. If, uh, if we want to establish what safe harvest levels are for a specific species from a Great Lake, then ultimately we have to get agreement from all the other jurisdictions. So one jurisdiction can essentially shoot down um, uh, a, an annual plan for a harvest strategy. So we work really hard at building those relationships to ensure that, that we can reach consensus on decisions that make a difference to not only our jurisdictions, but our stakeholders. Uh, through the Joint Strategic Plan, we have also committed to uh, uh, jurisdictional accountability. So when we take decisions away from the table uh, about harvest or stocking rates, um, we uh, are accountable for implementing those at each individual jurisdiction. So Ontario can't force us to do things, but we signed on to a the plan that says we'll be accountable for that decision if it's, if it's a consensus decision. In addition, uh, we've committed to information sharing and uh, ecosystem management. And, and I'd encourage folks, if you want some background on this, to go to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission website. It's www.glfc.org. And it details kind of the lake committee structure uh, in, in a lot more detail than what I have here. So uh, on Lake Erie, um, a couple of the primary things that we do on an annual basis through the Lake Erie Committee is establish um, catch quotas for walleye and yellow perch. And these fishery catch quota systems ensure biological safe harvest levels and sustainability in the future, but they also consider social, economic, and political issues. Ohio, as well as all the other uh, Lake Erie Committee agencies, have been involved in this um, interagency process for <clears throat> over 25 years. And uh, it's been highly successful at ensuring that uh, we have safe harvest of both walleye and yellow perch from, from the uh, Lake Erie system. A little uh, background or some details on really what quotas are. And quotas essentially are a proportion of uh, population that is safe to harvest. <clears throat> and what I've got here, <clears throat> excuse me, over in the upper right-hand panel is uh, the abundance of yellow perch from the west and central basin. 
through time, and you can see that that in general um, the populations have bounced around a fair bit. Um, for yellow perch, we uh, essentially went through a, a population crash back in the early 1990s, late 1980s, early 1990s, and had a period of extremely low abundance of yellow perch in the system. Implemented quota management for perch back in 96 and successfully rebuilt that population back up to, to much more sustainable levels. Uh, walleye, we've been involved in quota management for that species since 1976. So we've been doing this for, for a long time. Quotas are widely used in commercial fisheries management, not so much for recreational fisheries, but uh, we have kind of modified the, the, the quota management system to meet our needs because we have very significant recreational fisheries. And a quota, again, is that proportion of, of the population that we feel is safe to harvest. And we split that up among individual jurisdictions on Lake Erie, uh, generally based on the, the uh, uh, surface area that each jurisdiction has in either the lake or one of the management units. And this bottom, bottom right panel shows kind of how we split up the yellow perch quotas. In the West Basin, uh, Michigan, Ohio, and Ontario have, all have jurisdictional waters there, so each, each state or province gets a chunk of that, that uh, safe harvest level. So now I'll get kind of into the, the nuts and bolts of how we generate those quotas or safe harvest levels, and these obviously are based on enormous amounts of, of, of data um, and uh, both assessment and research data that we collect on an annual basis, and each one of the jurisdictions is committed to collecting those so that we can uh, fuel the process. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the first step, this assessment data component. Um, we have a number of programs, not only in Ohio, but in other jurisdictions that uh, collect information assessment data that helps feed the model to help us and helps to help inform us about the status of the populations or the health of the populations in Lake Erie. Two real uh, primary components of that assessment data are fishery dependent data. The fishery dependent data is essentially harvest data. Um, so each one of the jurisdictions around Lake Erie administers a recreational creel survey. Uh, with that recreational creel survey, we estimate the uh, harvest uh, at age of both walleye and yellow perch from the system on an annual basis. In Ohio, we've got uh, essentially six creel areas across Lake Erie that, that we assess on an annual basis from uh, May through October. Uh, we have creel clerks that are working all the major ports and harbors uh, to estimate fishing effort as well as harvest. And some of these photographs show the, the fishery itself. Um, as it's being prosecuted. This is one of our creel clerks collecting, collecting information. In addition to the recreational fishery, we summarize commercial harvest as well. Um, we have a commercial trap net fishery in Ohio. Ontario has a, a very significant uh, commercial gill net fishery. We also have seine fisheries that operate. So we characterize the fish, the, the, the harvest of fish coming out of Lake Erie on an annual basis. It's a fairly significant investment, but it's a cornerstone of essentially the, the, the interagency management structure, and each of the jurisdictions is committed to it. Second uh, piece of information that we use uh, from the assessment component is fishery independent data. Not only do we characterize harvest, but we use um, uh, several techniques, sampling techniques, to go out and, and uh, characterize the, the, the uh, fish community and relative abundance of species that we're concerned about. Two of the primary uh, fishery independent data series that we use uh, in the interagency management structure are our bottom trawls and our gill nets. And I've got some pictures here of kind of what that looks like. Um, the uh, upper right-hand panel is uh, a photograph of, of staff here pulling a gill net. Uh, from our fall gill net assessment. We use that to characterize adult abundance for, for walleye and yellow perch. So we have a relative abundance index of, of those through time. The uh, next panel down is the 53-foot research vessel that operates out of the Sandusky Fisheries Research Unit, the RV Explorer. Uh, primary trawling vessel. Uh, a trawl is just like what you uh, 
saw in Forrest Gump, the, the shrimp trawl that, that Forrest was pulling around, we use something very similar, drag it along the bottom, scoop up fish, and count primarily young fish, so young of the year, so we can estimate the hatch or the recruitment of individuals. This graphic up here to the upper left is a side scan sonar image of our bottom trawl as it's fishing. Just to give you some details, it's like a big funnel. Drop it down on the bottom. We've got these doors out here that spread the net out and open up the mouth. And here's the mouth of the net. And all the fish that we scoop up collect down here in what we call the cod end. And then we count them. We sample 40 stations across the West Basin monthly from May to September. And that's how we estimate what the, how good the hatch was. And this is a photograph here of essentially pulling in a typical trawl catch. You can see the the cod in there has a pile of young fish in it, and we'll open that up, dump them out, sort them by species and age, and then, then count them. And we do that lots. Um, this is the RV Grandin down here at the bottom right. That is the uh, research vessel that operates out of, the, out of our Fairport Harbor Station. And like I said, we use this information to characterize the, the, uh, the population, uh, particularly the relative abundance at age of fish from our fishery uh, independent assessment surveys. This graphic right here shows an otolith of a walleye from Lake Erie, a relatively old one. The otolith is just like, uh, count, counting an otolith is just like counting tree rings. You can see the, the various translucent layers uh, in the otolith, and each one of those indicates a year of growth. On an annual basis, uh, we, as well as other jurisdictions, summarize all this information in, in our Bible, essentially, and it's just a bunch of statistics, uh, statistical uh, analyses of trends through time for uh, various species in Lake Erie. Um, the the, the uh, document I've got here is our Ohio's fishery status from, from uh, 2012, but we do that on an annual basis, and all the other agencies do that as well. And then we take it and we combine it and we take each individual jurisdiction's data, it's all collected similarly, and we combine it to, to uh, uh, essentially feed into a population model that gives us an idea of the abundance of the individual populations out there, whether it be walleye or yellow perch, the various yellow perch populations. The uh, population model that we have is called a statistical catch at age uh, analysis model. It's it's uh, fairly typical for uh, generating um, abundance time series for uh, commercially managed species. Um, it utilizes the fishery dependent and independent data that I showed you just before to generate abundance estimates. And we use that abundance estimate to, to get an understanding of the status of the stocks or the health of the stocks of fish out there. And in the upper right uh, figure, you can see the abundance of walleye through time based on our current statistical catch age analysis model. And you can see that abundance varies very significantly from 1980 through 2015. Uh, we've seen uh, adult standing stocks of, of walleye from you know, right around 20 million up to upwards of 100 million fish, depending on the, the uh, size of the hatch and so on and the harvest strategy in place. Bottom panel again shows the yellow perch, and you can see that we had, you know, highly variable abundance for yellow perch, a rehab period in the, back in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, and then a rebuilding period through the through the 2000s. So that's the kind of information that we use to characterize the health of of the populations in Lake Erie. And then we take that information and we apply what we call a targeted fishing mortality rate to generate this safe harvest level. And these fishing rates essentially are derived by the Lake Erie Committee uh, with technical assistance from, from, from all the technical folks around the lake. And they're essentially a predefined pre harvest strategy uh, to ensure sustainability uh, of the resource and then also to meet stakeholder needs. They're based upon predefined uh, biological reference points. And I've got an example of one over here that we've used for walleye. We've got a revised one in place now, but it uh, essentially shows what our targeted fishing mortality rate will be based on population stanzas. So when we're real healthy, 
out here at the 40 million walleye range, we'll harvest them a little heavier. When we start to get back to areas where uh, our abundance is down, then the targeted fishing mortality rate goes down. And that, in turn, means the quota goes down. So these, these harvest strategies uh, are developed to ensure sufficient survival of the adults, that we've got adequate spawners to, to reproduce the following year, and that we are able to take advantage of a fishable surplus. This is an old one. We just went through a revision with the uh, uh, for walleye and actually implemented it last year. We've got a new harvest strategy in place that was developed not only by the Lake Erie Committee and, and the technical folks, but also with significant input from our stakeholders. So kind of the thing that comes out of this applied fishing rate is a recommended allowable harvest, and that comes out of the Yellow Perch Task Group or the Walleye Task Group. And then that value. Um, goes to the Lake Erie Committee for discussion. And we discuss those values as well as uh, um, additional social and economic input from stakeholders and on an annual basis make a recommendation for a total allowable catch or attack. And that essentially is the quota or the safe harvest level. And then uh, this, this graphic right here kind of shows what <clears throat> walleye abundances look like through time uh, relative to the walleye quota. And this is lake-wide, so this, this, we haven't gotten to, to what Ohio does with its share of the pie yet. So we're still talking lake-wide lake -wide abundance and quota. And you can see in the blue line that walleye abundance has varied from 20 to oh, well, almost 120 million. Had a really good hatch back in 2003 that drove this peak right here in 2005 when those fish recruited to the fishery. And you can see the quota down here is varied. It doesn't look terribly variable. Looks like it's relatively low. Um, it's varied you know, from two to upwards of 10 million fish, though, which is a, a fairly significant chunk. Doesn't look like it varies in concert with the uh, uh, abundance at all, but that's because of the scale. It really does. So whenever I kind of rescale this, you can see it a little different, but it also demonstrates where we've had different harvest strategies in place. So the blue line here indicates, again, the abundance. The red line scaled over here um, indicates the quota. And you can see the quotas have, have varied um, between 2 and 11 million fish on an annual basis. But that's driven in part by variation in and, and these harvest strategies that we've had in place. In the 1980s, we had you know, a, a specific harvest strategy. It was revised again, and the model, the, the population abundance model, was revised in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, and you can see a bit of a disconnect between what that harvest strategy is doing relative to the, to the abundance. Therefore, um, we went through a period where we um, kind of ratcheted things way back. It was called the co coordinated perfect management uh, strategy to, to rebuild populations, reduce harvest, to ensure that we maintain sustainability. Um, and that this is the CPM, CPMS period, the coordinated perfect management period right in here. Um, then we implemented a harvest strategy associated with the walleye management plan that was developed in 2005. And you can see how this is tracked through time with the abundance. And then we've just recently went through another revision on the uh, uh, harvest strategies. So it does link up to some degree with uh, the trends in abundance. But also, you can see some differences in the harvest strategy as we've moved through time. So again, like I talked about, um, once we generate those safe harvest levels, each jurisdiction then gets a piece of the, the, the quota. Uh, and it's generally driven by the amount of surface area that each jurisdiction has in, in Lake Erie. And then each jurisdiction takes that back, and they can allocate it as they see fit. We can't, we can't dictate to New York how they allocate their quota. They've got jurisdictional authority over it any more than they can dictate to us how we allocate our um, quota. However, we have committed to ensuring that we don't exceed that safe harvest level or quota. 
It's worked because each management uh, agency has maintained authority over its individual fisheries. Um, if you start to extend that out, I don't think the, the process itself would work. So, And each agency has, has made a commitment to implement rules and regulations to ensure that we comply with the, with the quota. So this is just kind of a, a recap on the interagency process that we conduct on an annual basis. So we collect all this assessment data, we feed it into a population model to get an idea of the status or the health of the stocks of walleye and yellow perch. We apply a predefined harvest strategy to generate quotas, and then each allocation or each jurisdiction has allocated a portion of those quotas, and it's exactly the same for both walleye and yellow perch. So there's, there's really no difference. Uh, the difference comes in with the allocation on the backside of each of the jurisdictions. The next thing that I wanted to cover off on just real briefly is some management principles that we use in Ohio for managing uh, the Lake Erie uh, fisheries. And first I want to cover off on the mission, talk a little bit about healthy fish communities, talk about science-based uh, decision-making, broad benefits, efficient use, and interagency partnerships. And Ohio Division of Wildlife's uh, mission is to conserve, improve uh, fish and wildlife resources and their habitats for sustainable use and appreciation by all. So that kind of uh, is is the primary guider uh, for for how we handle um, you know the high-level management of the resource. Sustainability is huge, but we want to maintain healthy fish communities. So ensure that we've got enough. Uh, fish out there not only to contribute to additional hatches into the future, but also uh, maintain ecological balance associated with that fish community. Science-based. Um, all of our decisions are driven by science, by uh, assessment and research. Uh, it's really difficult to make a decision in a vacuum, so we put a premium on uh, essentially the assessment side of things, the assessment and research, because that helps inform, helps us inform our decisions on things like the the health of the population, the status of the stocks, um, and then that ultimately helps us to uh, inform uh, what safe or sustainable harvest levels are. Uh, we use biological assessments, risk assessments, and uncertainty in developing those harvest strategies, and then uh, another key management principle is broad distribution of benefits. We've got very diverse stakeholder groups out there, um, not only recreational but commercial, and, and each one of those stakeholder groups um, uh, contributes not only economically but to quality of life in Ohio. So we want to make sure that those resources are broadly distributed across all of our stakeholder groups. Another management principle is efficient use of the resource. We want to minimize the impact of the fisheries themselves on the environment and other species. I got a picture up here of kind of a, a really bad looking picture of a commercial bycatch uh, episode that was occurring. A bunch of fish that were coming out of the net that were dead. We don't want that. If if uh, if we have those kinds of um, things occurring, then then we're not essentially efficiently using that resource. And then also uh, another management principle is interagency partnerships, and I've already kind of hit on that probably multiple times, but uh, it's a shared resource, and what happens in one jurisdiction can impact other jurisdictions, so we have to recognize that and work together. Now getting a little bit into Ohio's fisheries, we do have two uh, fisheries that we manage up here on Lake Erie. Uh, we've got a sport fishery. Um, the motivations for sport fishing are generally recreational for recreation, food, or profit. We've got about 300,000 licensed anglers that utilize the uh, Lake Erie resource on an annual basis, um, generate about 5 million angler hours per year targeted at, at, at fisheries on Lake Erie in Ohio. And we've got a, oh, not quite 792, about 750 charter, guide, charter guides that, that operate on Lake Erie generate nearly $800 million in economic benefit for, for the region. Commercial fisheries are a little different. They're profit-driven, employment and food. Um, we've got 18 commercial trap net licenses that we issue on an annual basis and around 30 SANE licenses. And that fishery itself generates right around $10 million in economic benefit on an annual basis. 
So now I'm going to switch into uh, implementation. How do we take our piece of the pie that we've gotten for walleye, the, that portion of the quota, and how do we allocate it? For walleye, it's really easy, or relatively easy, in that um, we only have one stakeholder group um, that utilizes that, that walleye resource, made a decision back in the 1970s, I believe, or early 80s, that uh, walleye were only available for uh, our recreational stakeholders. So we don't have to deal with various stakeholder groups outside of the various stakeholder groups within our recreational component. So really the objective for walleye is to ensure that Ohio's harvest is less than or equal to Ohio's quota. We're not shooting to catch the quota. There's no real benefit e ecologically to, uh, to pulling more fish out of the lake or pulling as many as we can out. We just want to make sure that we stay under what that safe harvest level is. We've got a number of tools that we can use to regulate the fishery including daily bag limits, gear restrictions, closed seasons and areas, protected species, and minimum size limits. But our primary tool is really this individual daily bag limit uh, uh, tool. So for walleye, <laughs> it, uh, there's some variation in how many fish our recreational har uh, fishery will harvest on an annual basis, and that variation is driven by the abundance of walleye, obviously, uh, weather, effort, and those kinds of things. But in general, we know what we're going to pull out on an annual basis. And you can see some variation over here on the right, which is our Ohio walleye harvest. Uh, back in the late 1980s, we had tons and tons of, of effort out there, and we harvested uh, almost five million fish. But we've kind of settled out in the past decade, decade and a half, at a fishery that will harvest with some variability around one to two million fish on an annual basis. So that gives us an idea of essentially, um, and that's that's at our base ba baseline bag limit, which is uh, uh, six fish, um, or actually four fish during the spring, March and April, and then six fish the rest of the the rest of the the, the year. So we know that, in general, our fishery is going to harvest right around a million to two million fish. If quotas get less than, if Ohio's portion of that quota is less than a million fish, then we'll have to reduce daily bag limits to ensure that we stay under under that uh, that uh, quota, that safe harvest level. So we've done some simulations with the uh, harvest assessment surveys, our creel surveys, and we can come up with an idea of what various bag limits would look like, or what harvest would look like with various bag limits. And then we've incorporated that into this table that you see over to the right, which is uh, essentially embedded in Ohio, Ohio Administrative Code. And this table right here ensures that we stay within uh, our, our quota allocation. So you can see that if quotas drop down for Ohio to between 750 to 850,000 fish, based on our creel surveys, if we had a bag limit of four year round, then we would ensure that our harvest stayed under that safe harvest level or the quota. So that's how we do it on an annual basis. It's a, a plug and chug almost. Yellow perch, a little more complex. We have both sport and uh, uh, commercial stakeholders involved, different tools and regulations for each of those groups. We've got multiple management units. I showed you that, that figure earlier that uh, uh, defined the, the individual management units for yellow perch. And then we've also got another guiding document, which is policy two, which is the utilization of Lake Erie fisheries resources. Policy two states that individual sport fishers get the first opportunity to take the harvestable portion of a quota and um, the uh, <clears throat> commercial fishermen may be allocated the remaining harvestable portion. So that kind of guides us in how we actually allocate any yellow perch uh, resources or uh, quota. Again, I wanted to touch on the fishery regulation tools, and you've seen the, the uh, list over to the left on how we would regulate a recreational fishery. Again, individual daily bag limits are the primary tool that we, we would use to restrict harvest. Commercial fishery, completely different. We've got limited entry. Um, we've got gear restrictions, closed seasons, protected species, 
individual transferable quotas and uh, minimum size limits. And the primary tool that we use for the commercial fishery is these individual transferable quotas. So each individual license gets a chunk of the quota pie. The next slide here, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we allocate between Ohio's uh, sport versus commercial fisheries. And we've got some additional guidance from what was what's called Senate Bill 77, which is implemented back in 2008. Uh, how do we decide how much of the yellow perch pie goes to which recreational or commercial user group? And the guidance that was provided through Senate Bill 77 said we'll base it on history. And history said that about 65% of Ohio's uh, Yellow perch harvest is associated with the recreational fishery, where 35% is associated with the commercial fishery, and, that, and that's based on historical uh, proportions. So uh, Senate Bill 77 essentially said use that, uh, which makes it pretty easy for us. Um, we will have to regulate the individual daily bag limits for recreational fisheries uh, to ensure that, that we don't exceed quota or that 65%. And then individual transferable quotas will be implemented to ensure that we don't exceed the 35% uh, proportion of Ohio's quota for, for yellow perch. And this, this graphic over here just kind of represents that really coarsely. You can see the 18 slices of the pie here for the commercial fishery and then the sport fishery to regulate through bag limits. Again, for yellow perch, uh, there's some variation in harvest in each one of those management units based on weather, abundance, and effort, but generally we know what we're going to harvest in the fishery. And the graphic over to the right shows what our annual harvest has been through the recreational fishery in each one of the management units. Blue line is the management unit one, which is the west base, and you can see that generally we harvest right around 800,000 pounds of yellow perch annually uh, in the recreational fishery. The red line is management unit two, which is the west central basin, right around Six seven hundred thousand pounds on an annual basis with variation, and then MU three, which is the East Central Basin, this orange one here, you can see that we have harvest right around five hundred thousand pounds on an annual basis. So we use that information to essentially construct a very similar table uh, that's embedded in in uh, Ohio Administrative Code to ensure. Uh, compliance for yellow perch as well. So our baseline bag limit is 30 fish across the board for yellow perch. Um, and then we have various bag limit reductions that come into play if the quota gets below some level in the West Basin. If, if we have a quota, if Ohio has a quota of less than 800,000 pounds, then we'd be forced to reduce the bag limit to ensure that we uh, were compliant with the quota. Very same analysis were run for for generating this table as uh, the analyses that were run for generating the walleye table. So again, we've got some complexity though here because we've got a commercial fishery as well. And and I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. So this this kind of really messy looking slide is, is intended to um, try to uh, demonstrate the, the, the steps that we take um, to allocate to the to the, uh, the the yellow perch fishery to uh, or the yellow perch quota to the various fisheries, the first thing that we use is this policy to again allocate first to the sport fishery across those management units to ensure that we're meeting the obligation associated with policy two, and then then we allocate the remainder. Uh, to the commercial fishery. And so what we do is we estimate what we think the sport harvest is going to look like in each one of those management units. And we allocate that portion of the quota to that fishery. Okay, If we don't have enough quota to meet our fishery needs in, in that management unit, then we have to reduce the bag limit to ensure that we don't exceed the quota. So that's where we run through kind of this, these steps right here is right here we allocate to the sport fishery and if quota is less than the predicted harvest then we have to reduce the bag limit. And then if we've got any uh, quota remaining in each one of those management units then we allocate that to the commercial fishery and it's split up among the individual licenses um, 
as an individual transferable quota. This graphic, again, tries to demonstrate it. it. It looks more complex than it actually is. I think of it, uh, kind of visualize it as having our quota in a, in a beaker. And we've got three beakers setting out, and we pour out in the, out of our big quota beaker into each one of these individual beakers. And, and uh, we meet our needs recreationally first, then commercially uh, afterwards up to 35%. So this actually is what it looks like for the 2015 allocation. Uh, you can see that the blue bars here indicate what we think the recreational fishery, or what we predict the recreational fishery is going to take on an annual basis, or at least in 2015, uh, from each one of those management units. About 800,000 pounds from management unit one, what, 700,000 pounds from management unit two, and 600,000 pounds from management unit three. And these, these estimates are all based on statistical analyses that we conduct on an annual basis. The black line and the arrow indicates what the quota is, or Ohio's quota is, for each one of those management units. So you can see that in management unit one, we allocated 800,000 pounds. That was all the quota that we had in management unit one. So it's all allocated to the recreational fishery. Management unit two, we got a lot of additional quota available to allocate to other fisheries, and management unit three is the same thing. So we can make up the difference of that 35% that we need to allocate to the commercial fishery in those two management units. And this is what it looks like. In 2015, uh, we allocated a chunk of the uh, uh, Ohio's quota, yellow perch quota, to the commercial fishery in management unit two, and in management unit three, and we ended up below essentially what could have been harvested, safely harvested from, from uh, each one of those management units. But we did achieve that 35% allocation to the commercial industry. So what we, what we on annually do then is reallocate that back to the recreational fishery. So not that they have to harvest it, a fish left out in the lake will survive and it will contribute to fisheries in the future. So in the end, that's what the yellow perch allocation strategy looks like. Um, it results in an overall 65% of the Ohio's yellow perch quota going to the recreational fishery, 35% to the commercial fishery, but that 35% is allocated in areas where we have room to allocate it. Um, that's why in certain years we don't have any commercial harvest from, say, the West Basin. It's because we don't have any additional quota to allocate to the industry in that location, but they make it up in other management units. So hopefully, and I don't, I don't even know where I'm at from, from a time standpoint, but hopefully this has helped you understand kind of how we go from the assessments that we conduct, which are absolute cornerstones to uh, fisheries management on Lake Erie, to the quota and then to the regulations, and demonstrated how this is truly an interjurisdictional exercise that ensures the sustainability of the resource, um, incorporates uh, fishery needs. Yeah, it's is science based and is very very process oriented, which makes it a lot easier because of the complexity of the the uh, fisheries that we manage up here. And I kind of blew through that, but um, I guess I'm at the end, and I'm I'm open to any questions that anyone has, and um, fire away. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Uh, we do have time for questions. Uh, so if any of you guys do have questions, feel free to type them into the, the chat bar on your screen. Um, I will start with one. In uh, the last two years, we've had really good ice cover on Lake Erie. Um, how has that affected uh, where we are in the quota because people have been able to get out and ice fish more? Well, the, actually, the ice fishery is we've had two phenomenal years <clears throat> of ice fishing for sure. Uh, first in my 20-some years here that we've had back-to-back -back years, is still relatively small compared to our open lake fishery. So the harvest associated with that ice fishery isn't much. It's just much tougher to get out. Um, the upside is, is when we get significant ice cover, we have good hatches of both walleye and yellow perch. And I think that's what we're seeing. Last year we had a, a good hatch of perch and walleye in the West Basin which will feed our fisheries in the next couple of years. So 
in the end, the, the recreational fishery or ice fishery is, is a relatively small component of our harvest. It doesn't really affect um, our quota per se because we've had enough quota to allow for additional ice ice fishery harvest. But uh, the upside is is it, it makes good hatches. Okay. Uh, the, the, another question is: uh, Does the timing of um, when people catch fish really affect them that much? Uh, I think this is in relation to catching fish when they're spawning. Um, again, the uh, vast majority of our harvest actually occurs in midsummer when folks can get out. Um, we do have spring fisheries that occur um, for both walleye and perch. Um, but it's, they're relatively small, and we don't have any sense that, uh, and we've got a lot of research on this, that uh, fishing effort or even harvest during the spring impacts sustainability of the resource nor uh, impacts uh, reproduction. So it's not like if you have no fishing out there, we guarantee that or have, have the ability to guarantee that we get a good hatch. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the science that supports that. It's mostly weather, ice cover in the winter, uh, spring storms, precipitation that drive the success of the hatch. Okay. Uh, we have a question about the algae blooms uh, that we're experiencing and w whether mm -hmm. or not it will affect walleye and perch populations. That's a really good question. Um, my, uh, and again, we've got some additional research that's, that's ongoing to try to understand the impacts of the algae on uh, not only walleye and perch, but the fish community in general. And we don't have real firm science behind that, but my, my gut says walleye and perch, they like what we call mesotrophic conditions, which are conditions that are moderately productive. They do really well in those kinds of settings. Uh, the West Basin is what we call eutrophic. It's highly productive. And the uh, algal blooms that we're seeing are a symptom of that. And, and I, 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 even though we don't have a lot of science to support it at this point in time, the algal blooms are a symptom of a eutrophic system that is not terribly productive to making lots of perch and walleye. So we've really got to get our heads around this to be able to, to, to provide the kinds of species that our stakeholders desire because it's negatively impacting that. The eutrophic conditions or the highly productive conditions that we see out in the West Basin right now are really conducive to growing uh, uh, white bass, white perch, channel catfish, and freshwater drum, sheephead. And most of our stakeholders are saying, man, I'm getting, I'm getting run over by sheephead or white bass or channel cats. That's because our, our lake is way too productive. Uh, do you have any idea of how this year's walleye hatch turned out? We will have uh, firm numbers on that after our August trawling survey. So um, we go out and we trawl monthly from May through September, but our benchmark of the hatch strength is August. Uh, earlier, so the May, June, and July trawls, we do see some young fish but they're still so small that they actually go through the mesh of the trawls. So we can't use that accurately to uh, depict what the hatch strength looks like. The upside is this year we are seeing, you know, we're seeing both walleye and perch in our early trawls. So it's always good to see them. We know they're there now. But we'll have the definitive by August. Uh, we have a question. Uh, could you address efforts to increase walleye and perch spawning habitats in the near shore and tributaries? Um, I can address to some degree. Um, walleye, in particular, um, obviously they're they're very site specific spawners. We have spawning stocks that utilize what we call the the open lake reefs, which is off the the. Uh, 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 west basin of Lake Erie, Locust Point area, fairly significant spawning area there. Uh, we also have um, populations that utilize rivers, so the Maumee, the Sandusky, the Grand River, Ohio, um, Cattaraugus Creek down in New York, Grand River, Ontario. Um, the Generally, the nearshore areas of Lake Erie, uh, unless you have gravel cobble, 
or bedrock highs are not terribly conducive to um, reproduction by walleye because it's primarily silt substrates. Addition of substrates in those areas likely is going to silt in. Um, where we do have some traction is up in the tributaries and one of the primary uh, projects that that we've been involved in over the past decade and a half it seems like is uh, trying to um, remove dams to allow for additional access to gravel cobble spawning substrate. Uh, one of the primary ones is up in the Sandusky River. Um, the Ballville Dam, we've been working with the City of Fremont, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Army Corps of Engineers to move forward on a plan to remove that dam, minimize the impacts of the sediments that are currently trapped behind the dam, but also allow for additional access to high quality uh, habitat upstream of the dam to allow for additional uh, reproductive uh, opportunities for walleye in the Sandusky River um, and hopefully increase productivity of that stock which has been declining. Uh, we have a question about what uh, what surveys you do in the Maumee River uh, when the when the walleye are spawning. Um, he's just wondering, the person was wondering what the electroshocking is. This yeah. Okay, um, we actually do a number of uh, kind of research surveys as much or research projects up in the in the Maumee and the Sandusky River on an annual basis. We got one project that is a primarily a tagging project. So when fish are congregated up in the rivers, they're easy to put your hands on, and so we'll put electro fishing boats in up there, collect fish, and we put transmitters in them. They're acoustic transmitters. We release the fish and then we track where they go. So we track their movements throughout the throughout the lakes to try to understand some of the behavioral aspects of walleye migration and movement. Other assessment surveys that we've conducted up in the river, rivers in the past are some surveys to try to understand run strength. So try to understand how many fish are running up the river. You'd think that'd be pretty easy to figure out, but it's really difficult because of conditions in the river itself. So we've got a pretty decent idea of that um, from some of our assessment surveys, but uh, we still need to, to do some additional research to understand how to most effectively count the number of fish running up the rivers on an annual basis. The last piece of work that we, we do up in the river is actually assess larval production or out migration. So we'll sample downstream with nets collect young walleye as they as they drift down the river to try to understand which individual river is producing which individual or how many fish essentially. Okay. So and, those, uh, those are the primary ones. Okay. One last question we have time for is do you know have in, any information on trolling harvest compared to casting harvest and also just in general how much effort is put into each of those two methods? Um, you know, we collect that on an annual basis, and let me see here. That's that's actually summarized annually in our the Ohio's Lake Erie Fisheries Status Report that's available online. But uh, let me see if I can. Okay, I've got the table here, so bear with me while I look through it. Okay, this is effort. Like wine. Percent of hours. Percent. Okay. So I'm I'm just going to give you effort because that's the table I've got open in front of me. About 18% of our annual effort is casting effort. About 50% of our annual effort is flatline trolling effort. And so that would be trolling with dipsies, with planer boards and stuff like that. And then about 27% of our annual effort is what we call depth control trolling. So um, depth control trolling is generally using, using uh, downriggers and stuff like that. So the vast majority of our, our effort right now is, is generally flatline trolling, where that's a huge difference. Uh, from what it was back in the late 80s, early 90s, where virtually everyone out there was was casting. Hmm. 
and then I, I can kind of give you a sense of the harvest rates for each one of those methods as well, but I can't give you the har harvest. Cause oh, yeah. I don't think I've got that table in front of me, but um, harvest rates for flatline trolling are not quite double what they are for casting, and then depth control trolling is about halfway in between uh, casting and flatline trolling. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, we've ran out of time for any questions. Um, if you guys still do have questions, Jeff's email is on the screen right now. You can email him with your questions. Uh, so thank you again, Jeff, for uh, the presentation today. Uh, I found it very informative and really appreciate your, you doing this. Sure, no problem. And it, like, like Ken said, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to either drop me an email or give me a call. My number's on the, on the screen there as well. All right. Thank you, and thank you, everybody who watched.